In this video, I'm going to show you how we can further extend work we did yesterday, turning the HTML5 boilerplate project into a progressive web app so that now we pre-cache all the static assets so that your website can load instantly and also start working offline. Hey guys, this is Chris Love here for Love to Dev. And today we're going to talk or introduce the concept of service worker caching through the concept of service worker pre cache uh, caching strategy. Now, in a previous video, I walked you through how to upgrade the existing HTML5 boilerplate project to be a progressive web app by adding a web manifest file and a service worker file that just had an empty fetch event handler. And remember, the other third part, if we actually deployed it, that would be required is be served over HTTPS. If you haven't watched that video, I do encourage you to go back and watch it just to see how we set things up. Now I'm going to be showing you again over localhost, so the HTTPS part won't be a part of this tutorial. But what we're going to do is we're going to take the files that are referenced to compose our page for the HTML5 boilerplate here, and we're going to put those into cache in our service worker using the install event. Now, I've referenced it in the video before that you do need to understand all the details of the service worker lifecycle to start beginning to master service worker development. But for today's tutorial, just understand that the install event is triggered every time a new service worker is registered. So that could be the first time somebody visits your site or any subsequent visit if you've made a change to the actual service worker code that will also trigger the install event. Also be aware that that does not necessarily mean that the new service worker is in control of that page and this gets into the minutia of the service worker lifecycle. So you may not necessarily see the results of what you're looking for uh, immediately, but trust me, they're there, okay? And you will see that on subsequent loads. Now, remember, like I said, we're using localhost. In this case, I'm over port 15001, and we've got our boilerplate project, and you can see that Chrome has prompted me to add it to the home screen. So we've still got our minimal requirements to be a progressive web app. I'm just going to shrink this down a little bit and get this out of the way because we don't really have any real content on this particular page of consequence. But what is important is seeing things in our developer panel. And what I've done right now is I've actually kind of cleaned um, the application so that nothing is cached. And we'll go through and we'll see how I've modified the code so that we can do pre-caching. Now we're going to start looking at the cache storage part down here in the developer tools. And you can see right now there's absolutely nothing going on. And I'm going to go back over here to the service worker panel. You can see we've got an active service worker that is running. And if we go to the sources, you can see that we have a service worker file, which is this one right here. And we can actually step, step through and debug it. And you'll notice there's a little bit more code than what we finished up with yesterday. So let's go walk through that code. Okay. Now, I put this in here so I could actually clean things up before we started running, so you would we would have a fresh, clean slate. So the first thing we want to look at is not these event handlers, but I've added a couple of variables. The first one is a name for the cache that we're going to store our pre-cached assets. And the great thing about the cache API is you can create as many caches, named caches, as you want, and you can control where different requests are stored by that. And this becomes very important if you have a more complex application. Okay, so the first, so you can cache anything you want. In this case, we're going to be uh, pre-caching content here. Next is a list of the files that we want to pre-cache. Now let me show you how I found these files. The first one, this this is an array, a job, just a simple JavaScript array of strings that reference the file. And this is going to be done either um, in reference to the root of the website 
or a, uh, a complete URL. So you can cache any asset you want. It doesn't have to be in within your domain. It can be any file that you're referencing. First, I want to cache the index.html file, but notice I'm not using index.html here. And the reason is, is because I want to be able to serve files as extensionless files. So the default setup on any web server in this case would make the index.html file be the default page. So any reference to whatever.com, for example, would be that index.html file. So I'm just going to reference it with a forward slash. Next is the CSS files. And we can go over here to our HTML file and we can see where we get those files. Um, just an important note before I go to those. We also reference the web manifest file, but you do not want to cache that in cache because then it may not necessarily get updated. And that's a bad thing. Um, I'm also not caching the icons. You could cache those, those icons. It's not necessarily going to add a lot of value to your application, but it might, might be something you look into. But what is important is caching files like CSS files, font files, uh, SVG files you may be referencing. Those are going to be important to, to go ahead and pre-cache. Now, um, I'll get into how to determine what files to pre-cache more here in a minute, but we're going to look at the files that are referenced by the index.html file. Now, these are static files here. These CSS files are not really going to change too much, so these are good candidates to pre-cache. Next, you want to cache your script files. And notice, we're going to be caching modernizer. We're also going to be caching jQuery. And then we also have a placeholder file for jQuery plugins and then a main JS, which is essentially a placeholder file for any application or page specific logic that you may need. Now notice right here, the boilerplate project has a little fallback in case the jQuery CDN is down, that it will reference a local version of the same file. And I won't get into the web performance logic behind this, but this is also a, a good practice you might want to pay attention to. But we're going to cache the one from the CDN because if we've got it cached locally in our service worker cache, it will come out of there and we won't have to worry about the CDN being down, which um, identifies one of the key components or one of the key features that service workers offer is the ability to work offline and control the files in a nice granular fashion. Okay, so if we go back over here to this array, we got the CSS files. I'm also um, going to cache the uh, logo file that we're showing on the page. If we go back over to our page, that's because I'm rendering out the image here as the default. And I just want to go ahead and cache that as well. And here are the four script files that I just isolated out. Now, normally when you're defining the array of files that need to be pre-cached, what you want to do is you want to identify what we call the above the fold files. And this is obviously going to be your website's homepage, the core CSS, the core JavaScript, and any core images and font files. You also may want to look at pre-caching um, any other top, what I call top level files, or files that may be accessed kind of early into your application, or quite frequently that also don't change a whole lot. Now, the rules about what, how you decide what that is are going to vary by application, and it's going to be that classic developer answer of it depends. So I advise you to kind of play around and experiment with what works best for your application. Every application I've worked on so far um, has a slightly different need as far as what can and should be pre-cached. So where do these files actually get pre-cached? That's done in the install event. Now, the install event triggers when a new service worker file is registered. Now, if the service worker file is the same as it's been, this install event will not get triggered. So you need to be conscious of that. Again, this falls into the realm of service worker lifecycle. And if you want to do a deep dive into the service worker lifecycle, you definitely need to take our service worker lifecycle course. But what I'm going to do here is inside of this event handler, I'm going to reference the caches object, which I think I just messed it up. There we go. And this is a globally available um, object inside of your service worker. And this exposes the cache API to us. 
And what you want to do is you want to open a specific cache up, which we named up here. I'm calling it pre-cache-hbp, just so we know what it's called. Now, if that cache does not currently exist, the open method will create a new named cache for you behind the scenes, and it's going to return a promise. Remember, everything inside of Service Workers works using the promise paradigm, so you will need to learn promises in order to work with Service Workers. Now, if you're not familiar with promises, a successful return is going to give you a then function, and you can then handle the response. You're going to get a reference to the cache object, and that cache object is going to have a method called add all. This add all takes an array of URLs. In this case, it's this, and all it is is just an array of strings that are references to the files. And it's going to store each one of those files in the cache for us. It's going to make the fetch request, and it's going to subsequently put those in cache for us. Now, if any of those files returns a 400 or 500 uh, status code, that's going to cause the add all function to uh, throw an exception. And anytime you have an exception in the install event handler, it's going to cause the service worker install to fail. So you need to be conscious of that issue. Now, next, how do we make all this really work? Well, for next, you're going to have to actually do some stuff with the fetch event handler. You're going to need to intercept all the requests and then branch out and do um, some cache checking. And we're going to keep it very simple for this tutorial. First off, we're going to use the event respond with function because we're going to put some logic in there, and this is what the event handler is going to actually respond with. I won't go into the details of that here. Just know that this is how you need to do it. Again, we're going to call that same caches object, but this time we're going to call the match function. And we're going to pass in the request. Now, the request is a member of the event object, and this is going to be the request that would it would necessarily or normally get sent down the wire or across the network. So it's going to have all the headers and the request body, etc., like that. And what's going to happen is the caches is going to underneath the hood when the, within this match method, it's going to look through all the files that are stored in all the named caches and see if any of the requests that are cached there match up to the request that's currently being made. If so, you're going to get a you're going to get a copy of the cached response, which is represented by the response variable here, um, and then you can just safely return that. Now, obviously, you could branch out and do all kinds of other logic checking and stuff like that. That's very advanced. Again, our service worker caching course will go into some of those more advanced caching concepts. But if there is not a cached response, what you want to do is you just want to, in this case, we're just going to pass it out to the network. And so we're going to relay this event request to a fetch call. And if you aren't familiar with the fetch API, you definitely need to learn the fetch API to start working with service workers and service worker caching. And if you're not familiar with fetch yet, fetch is replacing traditional AJAX or the XML HTTP request object. And it's a much cleaner promise-based uh, API to perform those AJAX calls we've been making for the last 15 years or so. In this case, we're just going to return it. We're not going to get into the, the nuances of caching these dynamic requests or things that aren't previously cached. Right now, I just want to show you how to do the pre-cache and how to uh, take advantage of that pre-cache. That's all we got to do to make our service worker essentially pre-cache the entire application. Okay? Now, let's go see this in action. And I'm just going to stick here in the developer tools because the web page isn't really going to change or anything for us. And we can actually set a breakpoint in here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reload. And so you can see our fetch is being caught right there. I'm just going to make that go. And we'll go back over here to the application. Uh, again, lifecycle related stuff. I'm going to tell it to skip waiting. If we go over here to the console, you can see installing pre-cached files. And if we go here, we don't see anything yet. And this comes down to the way the lifecycle stuff works. And this is where I was having problems earlier, just visualizing it. I may have to close the site and reload it, which is fine. It just looks like that's what I'm going to have to do. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. But what I want to show you 
is here is the network waterfall. Now, if I go up here to the top, we'll notice localhost. Notice how it's being retrieved from service worker now. And notice how these times are almost instantaneous. If it'll let me expand this out nicely, which it doesn't look like it wants to. Well, sort of. We'll do that. Okay, you can see these are 7, or really 5, 16, 19, 12. These are milliseconds that they're responding back. There's no network traffic going on. That's because they're coming straight from the local cache, and it's, it's uh, returning it extremely quickly. Okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kill this, and we will kill that, and I'm going to go do this. Do, and we should be able to load it back up. I believe this is the best way to get the cache reference here. Okay, so here we go. I'm noticing that the Chrome developer tools are not updating the way I'm wanting to, but you can see here all of our requests that we just specified in our pre-cache have now been cached. Notice that there is a response okay for everything, but the one that came from an external domain, um, it's there. It doesn't necessarily give us the response status code. Um, I'm not totally sure why we don't get that here. Um, to me, it should show us okay, but trust me, it's all fine. So any requests for these files are now going to come out of cache. And if we go back over to the actual page, you can notice that it's loading almost instantaneously. The part that's keeping this from this causing the X to, to show kind of loading it's the analytics file coming from the Google Analytics stuff, and that's what's triggering that. So if I kill it, reload, just notice how fast it's coming. Now, obviously, it's coming across the local host bus, but now it's actually coming within the browser. So there's literally no network latency. So precaching is a great way to make your application feel like it's loading instantly. And obviously, if you've got a more complex application, there's a lot more logic you may need to put in place to really drive the whole experience, but you can definitely give the user a great initial experience, that instant loading. This is one of the main reasons why Twitter has moved all their mobile stuff to a progressive web app and have started deprecating their native applications because this is way faster and it's much easier to maintain and deploy across different platforms. Now, if you found usefulness out of this video, please check the like button. If you've got any questions or comments, leave those in the, in the comment section below. I'd love to dialogue with you about this. And if you feel so inclined, please share it with your other developer friends as well. Thanks a lot, and I hope this was helpful.